Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Abelardo de la Peña Jr. I'm the director of marketing and communications for La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, and we welcome you to En Casa con la Plaza. This is our way of bringing our programming to you at, in your homes, at work, wherever you're at, on your phone, on your pad, on your laptop, to bring our uh, just our culture, uh, the, the culture, our art, our history, through different types of programming. And today we have a great one. We know it's been a tough weekend for all, and um, tough week, tough weekend. So let's have a little, little appetite-inducing diversion. So on Mondays, we do our En Casa con la Plaza Casino, Casino, Cocina, I'm thinking Las Vegas, I guess. <laughs> but uh, here we are, and I'm gonna introduce to you Jimena Martin, our Director of, Senior Director of, educa of Education and Programming, who will then introduce our special guest. So please take it away, Jimena. Mil gracias, Abelardo. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to kick off this week with Brett Thompson and his beautiful wife, Lucy. Um, they are the founders of Pez Cantina and also of Milk Ice Cream Parlor in Hollywood. Uh, Brett is a former Patina Group executive chef and both him and Lucy have created Pez Cantina um, that were influenced uh, by the various trips to Loreto in Baja, California. Um, also, they serve beautiful seafood, great cocktails, and they will be uh, presenting today at an Chile. So without further ado, I pass it on to Brett. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Abelardo. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, like you said, it's been a really tough weekend, but we are here to share our love for food and cuisine and have a, a delightful distraction. Yeah, definitely. I think we all need this right now. It's been uh, a restaurant. It's right downtown uh, on Grand Avenue there. And, um, you know, it, you know, we walked out on Friday afternoon to see everything starting to happen. So it was pretty intense. And I think that, you know, um, this is like, uh, you know, it's a very uh, interesting moment. And I think uh, we've been cooking a lot at home. We've been at home for three months now. We've, you know, been playing a lot with food. Uh, you see be behind me, I have a garden here. And so, you know, we've uh, definitely been uh, having a, a good time cooking a lot, you know, for uh, Lucy and I and, and the two boys we have, and they get involved as well. So, and, you know, thank you to, um, in, in Casa Con La Plaza, um, Jimena, you've, you know, it, it's great working with La Plaza and we really appreciate the relationship and it's just a pleasure for us to be on here. Yeah, and celebrating the different Latin cultures and, and LA cultures, so thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you so, guys for joining us. Yeah, so let's take our mind off of the real world for a second and, and come right here. Like we got, yeah. this, is, this is sort of our fantasy land right here of stuff we got. This is the this is the way we roll a lot, uh, which is, you know, th uh, lucky for us, um, you know, from, uh, you know, th these uh, beautiful Meyer lemons from our garden and uh, cilantro as well and cucumbers you can't see, but they're down here. Uh, we're also going to be doing some great cocktails today. We have a new uh, uh, little spin um, company we started since since uh, going into this uh, quarantine, which is called Pez Craft uh, Cocktail Mixes. And we've got like 11 different flavors, which has been fun. This is a paloma with tamarindo and grapefruit. It's amazing. It's yeah. one of my favorites. And then if you like the spiciness, we have a little cucumber smash as well. That's delicious. Yes. So we'll I think we're going to have to invite you back for the summer and you can yeah. showcase <laughs> your Pez cocktails. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we've, you know, we, this is just one of a million different recipes we have. So we love we love our cocktails as much as we love our food. We got we and mm -hmm. and we tend to have a sort of a tropical feel at our bar, just a lot of fresh fruit juices and fresh fruits, and that kind of stuff. So uh, it's really great. And so yeah, a little bit about us. We um, yes. uh, Lucy and I opened uh, Pez Cantina uh, in 2015, so it's been five and a half years now. Mm -hmm. Just celebrated our fifth year anniversary, and uh, wow, what a what a year to celebrate our fifth year anniversary. Uh, you know, things have been uh, really amazing. Um, uh, we uh, were, like, like you mentioned, um, we're big fans. I know you're a big fan of La Paz, you were telling me earlier today. Uh, we haven't got down there yet, but we do spend a lot of time in Loreto. And if you've never been to Loreto, it's a sleepy little fishing town. And thank goodness it's still very sleepy, which is really cool because that's kind of the, the cute quaintness of, about the town. 
Um, but, you know, uh, I grew up fishing a lot. My uncle and my dad would, would take me fishing on these overnight boats when we were kids. We, you know, we'd generally go out from San Pedro and it was always a night of like, okay, let's go out to dinner. All the guys would be out there, you know, kind of, uh, we'd have dinner and then we'd head out to the boat around midnight and go to sleep below the boat. And by the time we woke up at 6 a.m. in the morning, 6.30, we were out, you know, 15 miles out there, the Channel Islands, and we have breakfast in the galley and fish all day. So I really have this like ingrained love for fishing and the ocean. And um, so it really made a lot of sense. And, you know, uh, lucky me, my uncle ended up buying a nice little fishing compound down there. So we go down there all the time and we, Lucy and I and her brother and some friends were down there and we were fishing usually for Dorado uh, mm -hmm. or Mahi Mahi. And we brought some back and we were, this is before we opened up Pez and we said, Hey, let's open a, let's open a fish taco joint and just do like fish tacos and beers, right? In ceviche. And well, fast forward two and a half years and we ended up opening a 170 seat restaurant on Bunker Hill. Um, so that was quite a trip. And so, yeah, then now, you know, five years later, we're just feel very blessed and we love our baby. It's, 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 uh, can't wait to get back yes. cooking again there, you know? Um, so, you know, that's, it's, it's been a great road, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And for me, even though I'm from Guanajuato and it is inland from Mexico, my dad has always had a love for marisco. So anything shrimp is like, well, send his head spinning. So this recipe yeah. in particular is one of his personal favorites. Yeah. The, fir the first time I had agua chili was with, was with Lucy's dad and Lucy and family in Guanajuato in San, Pan in San Francisco de Rincon. Rincon. And I had never heard of it. It was like a plate of like purple, just marinated shrimp with a habanero and red onion and uh, cucumber yeah. and lime juice and salt. That was it. Super simple. And it was so spicy. I mean, just like laced with habaneros. And so that was my first introduction to it, mm, which your mouth water. <laughs> I know, which I think honestly is like, generally that's the way you find it in Mexico. Uh, pretty simple. You know, again, it would be, the, it would be shrimp. And most of the time I find in Mexico when you have it, the shrimp are pretty purple. So they're not really marinated very, very long. Mm -hmm. Um, and which is a, which is a little different than the way I make it, which it's not a bad way. It's just a little different. I, I prefer to cook the shrimp a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, generally it's a shrimp and, uh, and habanero and onion and cucumber, um, lime juice and salt, you know, that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's something that I've had in my, in my repertoire since then, cause I just love it. And I love, um, you know, I think it's Mexican like sashimi. It's like a good sashimi. I mean, I do. Yeah. I, I always say people who love like raw fish or sushi or sashimi, they would love pescantina because we always do, we do a ton of different like mariscos from agua chiles and cocktails and all kinds of cool stuff like that. And it's traditional, but at the same time, you know, I might put some garlic chive blossoms from our garden. I might put some pickled onions or pickled vegetables because I, I think it works really well. So, you know, it is traditional. Uh, I think respecting the tradition, the authentic recipe, but have being playful and using a different presentation, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, so. Okay. That's a question. Well, What's the difference yeah. for those who are new to us here? What is the difference between a ceviche and an agua, and agua chile? So, uh, okay, most of the time, and you know, from what I've, from what I've learned, um, agua chile is mostly made with shrimp. Now, I know that the term agua chile nowadays is loosely used. I mean, some people will, you know, even me, I did like an octopus agua chile, which I don't think is traditional. <laughs> But I, I'm, um, you know, a, a ceviche is the right, you know, uh, the, the ceviche made the right way is a fish or shrimp or, uh, you know, I guess you could do abalone or you could do scallops or you could do, you know, any like uh, uh, fish really um, that is cooked in, you know, citrus juice and salt. Now the salt part, that's, you know, I like to put a good amount of salt with my ceviche. But yeah, uh, so that's that. And then the agua chile, I believe, you know, is just sh usually shrimp traditionally cooked with lemon or citrus juice and salt. And, so, and chile, which is why it's right. called an agua chile. Yeah, because so agua so chile does mean... Really spicy. Yeah, because agua chile would mean like fire water. Yeah, pretty right? much. Or chile water. Chile water, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so I guess the chile is, a, is, a, is, a, is an interesting, um, is definitely a very, very important part of it. Um, but I've seen different variations. We were down in... Uh, uh, in San Miguel de Allende, Guanajuato, and I was, we were in a, this little cafe, I can't remember the name of it, I saw agua chili in the menu, I ordered it, and I saw the guy throwing a bunch of stuff in the blender, cilantro, tomatillos, cucumber, everything in the blender, and made this, like, and lime juice, and made this amazing green, like, puree that was 
and poured that on the on the uh, shrimp, and it was amazing. And actually started making my agua chili like that for a while. That's mm -hmm. not the agua chili recipe we're going to make today. We're going to do more traditional, but so again, it's it is kind of a a loosely used term, but yeah, that is that. Are, those are sort of the differences. And I think okay. also ceviche, traditional, you'll find tomato, onion, cilantro, cucumber, lime, mm -hmm. salt, um, avocado. I guess that would be, you know, a traditional ceviche. Um, and then again, you could add, you could blend some tomatillos in there, make a ceviche verde. You could so some cilantro, you know, puree the puree those ingredients. There's a lot of different things you could do, but I think both, both of them basically are, are cooking the fish with um, citrus and salt. Great. And you don't have I to, just had to ask. I just had to ask. Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's a really good question. And people will say like, well, do you have to use lime? No, you don't have to use lime. You could use, I mean, I've got these great Meyer lemons today. And Meyer lemons no. are like my favorite. I love Meyer lemons. They're a little sweeter than, than regular lemons. But the tanginess of the lime, I think is what makes it really yeah, the, mm -hmm. the lime really gives it that like kind of, it's got, um, yeah, it's got a, I don't want to say bitter, but it's got a bit of a bite to it. Right. You know, and, and so, yeah, and never, ever, 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 ever buy like store made lime juice or lemon juice. Oh, and, okay. Unless it's like, 100%. <laughs> unless, like Pericones is one we use at the restaurants because it's a freshly squeezed every day and we go through gallons and gallons and gallons of it. But even then, when you squeeze like a lime, you get the zest out of it, the oil. You know, uh -huh. that's, that's why it's so, be so much better if you do that. So, well, shall we get into this? Yes, let's start. I'm hungry already. Show me. I know. Okay. So, um, the first thing I've got here, um, and another thing we were talking about before, Jimena, was the kind of shrimp, right? Um, yes. So, at the I'm, I'm a big fan of um, uh, red Argentine shrimp. Um, and so I've done a couple things here, and I just want to I want to show you the the variety you can use. So these guys here are red Argentine shrimp, and you can see the color on them. And I've had these marinating already because I wanted to kind of get prepared to kind of show you the presentation with these for about an hour. And um, I like them because they almost have like a almost a lobster sweetness, almost a lobster texture. And uh, you can they're they're actually you can find them at a at a any market. Well. A, you know, quality seafood market. And so these are red, Ar red Argentine shrimp. These are black tiger shrimp. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, you know, these are also just, just as good. Um, there's also Mexican white shrimp. There are langoustines. Uh, they, you know, there's so many different types of shrimp you can use. Honestly, whatever you can get your hands on, number one thing, they're fresh. Right, but for me, I, I feel like as much as I love the Argentine shrimp, um, not being a chef myself, Sometimes I feel like they're cooked already because they're already red, and that's the indicator that they're ready to go for me. And uh, so sometimes that throws me yeah. off. But the taste is really nice because you get the tanginess of the citrus plus the sweetness of the flesh, which is really nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, you're right, that's true. And I think the like the black tiger, the white uh, Mexican white shrimp, they have a little bit more of a pop. Uh, the other ones are a little more tender. These are these kind of like pop in your mouth a bit. So that's you know that's those are two shrimps we're going to kind of do today. Prayer. Yeah, total personal preference. Okay, so I'm gonna talk, I've got these ones here already like butterfly, basically, um, and I've deveined them. So, but I've kept a couple here and I'm gonna show you how I do that. Um, you can have, I've got this fancy deveiner thing, which is like this thing you stick down the spine and you kind of just crack it up like this. Or if you don't have that, you can use your hands. And so this one, the head is off and I got the tail and the shell on these little legs here. So basically what I like to do is kind of just grab the legs, sort of like in the, in the down here, like in the belly area, and I'll just kind of rip it like that to the side. And once I get about halfway back, I'll sort of squeeze the tail and it kind of pops right out like that. You know, some people nice. say, oh, why don't, huh? Nicely done. It's, you know, I've only done about 6 million of them, you know? Um, so yeah, poor shrimp. <laughs> so, um, and, um, uh, and then what you want to do is you want to devein them. So what I'll do is just to do two, you know, kill two birds with one stone or, what's, or, or feed two birds with one bowl of delicious bird feed. Um, I'll, so we're going to cut this in half. So we're butterflying it while we're deveining it. And you can see there, there's, I don't know if you can see there, but there's no vein in there actually. Um, and the reason why is because fish, uh, these shrimp uh, cultivators have got pretty good about like stop feeding the shrimp before they harvest them. So kind of all the feed goes through the body. And generally, as I was doing these here, only one of them really had 
anything to, to, to clean out. So um, again, I'm going to just kind of grab it like this, grab the legs, just kind of, you know, I, I grab them pretty, you know, hard, make sure that they come right off and you see, you squeeze here and it comes right out. Um, some people say, yeah. Um, one of our viewers here says, can red Argentine shrimp found locally outside of Los Angeles? Well, they are from Argentina. Um, I have seen that Trader Joe's. I see them there oh, often. Great. Trader Joe's. Yeah, yeah. We, we shop at Trader Joe's a lot, uh, not to plug Trader Joe's, mm -hmm. but um, that is probably where I see them most in a retail level. Uh, I think like two years ago, they caught like, there were just so many red Argentine shrimp on the, um, down, I think near Patagonia, uh, mm -hmm. I believe. And they like, they're just a, a, a massive abundant amount of these. So the price came down, you know, supply increased, price, price came down and it's a great product. So, but that's a great question. And, I'm and sorry, then we got someone else here asking, um, do you eat the shrimp raw? You don't, or you don't cook them? I guess, yeah, you can. The actual uh, lime juice is what cooks the shrimp. Yeah. Huh? So if Thank you just you. let it sit there, it starts cooking it, and it releases a lot of water. So it's kind of helpful to let them soak in that liquid and then drain that liquid out because it gets a little bit milkier and a little bit muddier. Yeah. And then you have like just the cooked shrimp, and then you can add fresh lime juice onto that. And then, Thank yeah. you for clarifying. Yeah. Um, you know, you could think of it as like, so I'm going to put the shrimp in here, and I've got a ton of limes here. Um, you could think of the, the shrimp, like people say, oh my God, well, it's not cooked with heat, with fire. How is it cooked? Well, think about like prosciutto or think about like salami or think about, um, you know, uh, all these like great like charcuterie or cold cuts. Basically, it's salts and, and you, you know, you're introducing it to the, to the protein and it's removing the water and it's cooking it through. So this is just a quicker sort of cure. I guess you can call it a cure, right? Mm -hmm. um, to something like you'd say, you know, rather than letting it dr hang dry for, for a long time. Okay, so uh, where's my little guy here? It is. Okay, so I've got plenty of lines here. Uh, one that? more question from Nancy de los Santos. Um, if you do have to devein shrimp, what's the easiest way? If you do have to de devein shrimp, I think the easiest way is just what I showed you right there, is yeah. uh, just to, uh, you know, do with your hands and rip, you know, kind of, Start at the head area, kind of rip down towards the, the tail area, and just kind of pull right off. Let's pull the vein okay. out, um, butterflying it, and opening it up. It just exposes the vein, and it's easy yeah. to remove. And Nancy, um, that's a good question. I actually, what I did with these guys is I put them in a little bit of ice water, and they kind of it helped me remove any of the vein part that I didn't see as well. So, and you can generally find them, you know, um, you can generally find them already cleaned, ready to go, and raw. Uh, and a lot of times they'll be butterfly already. So if you really just kind of ask out there, yeah. you know, you can, you can find the right product and you don't have to spend your time. Cause it does take, if you're making agua chili for like a big group of like 25 people or whatever, or yeah. even 10 people, it could take a long time to do that. You know, I've been there. <laughs> it, it, the, price, the price difference is a lot different. If you buy them, um, unpeeled and, and yeah. not deveined, the price is much lower because you have to put the yes. work into it. But another thing, uh, another plus about having all the shrimp um, shells, you can make a nice soup after, which we do a lot. We'll make like a nice little caldito or, mm -hmm. you know, so there's a lot you can do with it. Um, so you guys can see- super adventurous. You can like keep the heads and deep fry them. Oh yeah. Ooh. Like they do in the Japanese um, oh, yeah. restaurants. Ooh, it's my those. favorite. <laughs> I love those. Yeah, if you do that, you know, I'll usually use like just a little bit of cornstarch and some salt and it's, it tends to get that, that beautiful oh, crispy gosh. taste. Oh, those are ama ebi. Those are sweet shrimp. Yes, the sweet and shrimp. And they're seasonal. So when they show up, I run and get them. You know, Quick yeah. Question. Um, yeah. Um, can you explain your thoughts on farm-raised seafood versus wild-caught? Oh, I love that question. That is such a good question because, because I, just, I just have, in the last you know, year, I have um, really changed. Um, I think we both changed our opinion on this. Um, and basically, you know, I was always like, always like, like, you know, just bragging, oh, everything we're using, we'd always go after wild caught fish. Um, there's certain things like shrimp or oysters are raised on oyster farms in Northern California that are just kind of not available wild. I mean, there are these, these, these shrimp, the, the Argentine ones are wild, but most shrimp, these guys these here these are, are wild also. They're from Mexico. oh, they're wild. Okay. So a lot of times though, the ones you find, right. Are, are going to be raised. farm raised and as long as they're farm raised sustainably with the right feed then there's no problem so 
we were talking him in about um, my friend James who has that Kampachi farm down in La Paz. Okay, so this guy has, he raises Kampachi, which is like a sort of like a small hamachi. It's, it's a beautiful kind of fatty pink fleshed fish about, I don't know, it's about two and a half feet big and they're about seven pounds each. And it is the most gorgeous fish. And he raises them there from like these tiny little, I don't know what you call them, like I guess eggs to like little tadpole, tadpole looking guys. And, and, and then he puts them into this massive, like a massive net uh, out, outside of La Paz there. And they swim very freely. I think it's like 200 yards diameter all the way down. And um, the water is clean and clear. It's not like these videos you see of like, not to say anything bad about tilapia or anything like that, but you see some of these videos of this, these fish that are swimming around in their own waist. And it's so, and, and he brought up a really good point to me. He said, when are we gonna, dis when are we gonna make the decision to stop like sweeping our oceans of wild fish and really learn how to you know, raise and cultivate aquaculture fish sustainably and in the right way. And I was like, And boom, ethically, like, I think that that was the most important because sometimes we would always go after wild caught and you learn that when they rake the, the ocean, they're catching dolphins and they're catching anything that gets caught in those nets just to fulfill the need for wild caught. So here, here we have an aqua farm that treats his animals so great. I mean, he treats it, he loves his fish and they're there to give us back our, our nourishment, but it's done in such a, in such a sustainable way that it was, it just really completely changed our mind and yeah. our view of a, of a farm raised fish. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's just finding the right, the right farm, you know, um, but that's a, that's an amazing question. And I just think just to end it off that, that farm raised, farm raised fish is as good as wild fish if it's mm -hmm. done right. You know, you just got to know your source. Um, okay, real quick on that. I wanted yeah. to show you how much uh, lime juice I have in there. It's really mm -hmm. swimming in lime juice. Um, if you don't do that and if you don't move it around, it's going to kind of be stuck in a ball and all those little areas in the middle are not going to get the lime juice. So you want it to penetrate in there. And so it's a lot right there. And you can see them already turning pink. See? Yeah. That, that's my indicator usually. Right. So, and um, I'm going to put a good amount of salt and I'll use like, you know, either sea salt or kosher salt. I will never, ever, ever, ever use iodized salt. I don't have it in my kitchen. There's no use for it. Uh, kosher salt is a very, very good uh, option and it's super cheap. Super it's affordable. Very affordable. So, you know, and I'm going to put a lot of uh, freshly ground black pepper. I like black pepper, especially with agua chili. I don't know what it is. It's just that that black pepper flavor is just so awesome with the shrimp. Sorry, just to get back to the, uh, the raised um, fish, um, can, he, can you recommend good sources for farm raised fish here in Los Angeles? Besides the wonderful vendor in La Paz, which I know that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just everyone go down to La Paz, okay? It's, it's, <laughs> it's pretty and fun. And, um, okay, so I've seasoned that. And basically I'm gonna put this in my magic refrigerator down here for about an hour. Um, yeah, so uh, you know, you know, first thing that comes to the top of my head, if you live out in Santa Monica, Santa Monica Seafood has a store on Wilshire there. It's amazing. They're great. Um, that's what, we buy a lot of seafood from them. Um, but you know, uh, again, Trader Joe's, uh, any reputable market, uh, Whole Foods, and I don't want to like. Or small markets. Yeah. I mean, we've got Howie's here in San Gabriel and their seafood department is just gorgeous. Right. And they can tell you exactly where the, the product is coming from, which I think yeah. is really is, is, is a nice approach to, to, and to also support small businesses. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's good to educate yourself a little bit. It's like, it's like if you, if you are that serious about knowing the difference between sustainable and farm raised, I'm sorry, and, and wild, um, you know, look, look into it. Like, uh, you know, like for example, I, I always thought tilapia was like this gross fish, but then I had, you know, Santa Monica seafood send me some tilapia that was like very, very nicely sustainably farm raised, delicious and totally changed my opinion on it, you know? So it's really just knowing your source. I, uh, you know, we'll go with them and they have like the Monterey Bay Aquarium up in Monterey has like a, they're sort of the, the um, authority on sustainability. And like, if you go to their website, they will have, you, you put in the name of the fish and it'll tell you how sustainable it is. If it's a good fish to eat, if it's not a good fish to eat, and it's, it's incredible because that's, that's, I'm glad someone's doing that, you know? All right. So, um, Shrimp's done. So, okay, a couple things here. So we got cucumbers. I've got some serrano chilies. I've got avocado. 
We've got some, some radishes, red onion, and some cilantro. Now the cucumbers I'm using uh, are Persian cucumbers. And the reason I use Persian cucumbers is because the skins are really thin and the seeds are really small. No need to peel them, no need to seed them. And um, I mean, that's all I use nowadays. I, 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 it's funny because I never even knew they existed until about eight, 10 years ago. And all of a sudden it, it kind of flooded the market now. So, uh, so those guys there. And I've got some tostadas. And just real quick, on the tostadas, um, I don't have a deep fryer at home. Most people don't have deep fryers at home. I like to eat taco chili with some chips or tostadas. I actually, what I do is um, just put them in a toaster oven and bake them. And they're, they're so awesome. You can see they're super crispy and they kind of get a little bit different of a crispiness to them. They're really, really good. And I, we kind of did that one time with, in an emergency. We didn't have what we needed, so we kind of did that. So, all right. Um, now, I want to talk about one thing real quick. Um, the good saying, I think it was Abraham Lincoln or something, he said, if you have four hours to chop a tree down, make sure you spend three hours sharpening your tools. Always have a sharp knife. I have a diamond steel here, kind of flat on one side and skinny on the other side. And so uh, this is like a 17 degree angle. I know that's a little bit difficult to maybe translate at home, but um, you know, uh, just practice that because a sharp knife really makes it a lot easier to get the job done and also cuts everything uh, much more organized. And so you want to have all your mise en place ready. So you see how I'm, all my ingredients here. Mise en place basically is a French word that means like everything in its place. So it's important whether I'm doing this or at the bar at the restaurant. I mean, when we're, you know, when you're cooking for a, a big group, it's important you have everything here so you're not running to the kitchen, running here, running there. So you have everything in, in its place, all your mise en place ready. So on the uh, cucumbers, I'm just going to slice them thin. And uh, I've also got this other tool here called a mandolin. You can also use this. It's one of my favorite tools. And you can adjust the, the thickness and you can, you know, if you feel comfortable to do like this, it's another great tool for slicing thin. I have a question while you're slicing away there uh, from, Esco, from Irma Escobar. Uh, yeah. Why not use iodized salt? Does it change the flavor? Uh, it does. Um, I don't, I, you know, it's, Iodized salt, I think maybe because I'm a, I'm a chef and I cook all the time and that's what I do. I just, there's a flavor you get out of it. Is that the iodine in it? I, I guess so. Um, perhaps it is. It's got this sort of, um, it's hard to say. It's like not bitter. It's almost astringent in a way. Uh -huh. um, and it just doesn't season like, I, I, it's, it's a very hard to, to explain the difference. Uh -huh. um, but it's also, also another big thing is that uh, when you're cooking with uh, iodized salt, it really sticks to your fingers. Um, you know, as a chef, we're, you know, our, our hands are, you know, maybe wet or moist or sticky from, from cooking something else. And then when you go to grab something, you know, the salt really sticks to your fingers. Where the kosher salt or a, 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 a larger salt doesn't stick to your fingers, it's a lot easier to season and kind of season evenly, you know. Okay, so now the serrano chilies. So serrano chili... Uh, I'm sure many of you know what serrano chilies are. Um, I didn't have habaneros today, so I use serranos. And you can feel free to do really whatever chili you want. Um, habaneros are spicy. Uh, serrano chilies are pretty spicy as well. Uh, jalapenos are a little less spicy. What I like about serrano chilies is that um, they kind of have a bright, almost like yellow flavor, if that makes sense. It's just got this like super, almost citrusy flavor. And, but you gotta be careful because they can be very spicy. Um, and then, so in this, I'm going to leave the seeds in there and I'm going to dice it. You could slice it really thin if you wanted to, um, but I'm going to dice it. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to cut it all the lengthwise like this, almost to the stem. I'm going to turn it one quarter turn. I'm going to cut it one more time like that. And I'm going to just slice it really, really thin. Now this way, those little chili wheels you're, you're slicing right now are not full on wheels. They're actually quarter wheels. So they're going to get a little bit less chili in your mouth. So you're not gonna, you know, burn your head off. Um, although some people love it, you know, I've seen people just take s just salt and chilies and kind of eat them like that with their with their meal, which is incredible. Um, if you wanted to, you can also take out the seeds. The seeds and the um, and the veins are really what's what is the spiciest part. 
And if you want to take out the seeds, you know, basically just cut it down lengthwise like this and sort of spread that out with your fingers and kind of just go down the length of the chili like this carefully. You don't want to cut your hand. And you can see the seeds come right out like that. And then, uh, then you just have, you know, just the, just the chili uh, pod, okay? I use a spoon because I get scared of my oh, sharp good. knife. So I just cut it in half and then I get yeah. a spoon to just scrape it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so next thing we have are some radishes. I like radishes. I don't think they're traditional, but they, they're, first of all, they're, they're, they're delicious. They're crunchy. They look pretty. Uh, the color red is great on there. And I wash them really well because the radishes tend to be kind of sandy. Um, and, you know, people say, like, we have all kinds of great radishes, not just red radishes, but if you see any kind of like those Easter egg radishes at the market or, you know, there's a ton of different radishes available out there. Feel free to use any of those. They're all really great. With the radishes, I do like to use the mandolin because it just, it's a little easier. You know, with, the, with a knife, it's kind of round, so it wants to roll around. But with the, the mandolin, set it to your adjust, you know, your, your setting and kind of just slice away. And you can see how, you know, they get super, super thin. Can you see that? Yeah. Paper like. I'm gonna make it actually make it a little thicker. But um, you know, they're great. Uh, I'll take sometimes I'll I'll pickle the radishes, I'll put the radishes. I think it's a trick I learned from Lucy's mom. I'll put them with some salt and lemon juice for about mm -hmm. 30 minutes and they turn really pink and delicious. And those are also great, kind of change things up a little bit. Again, have fun with the recipe. Yes, there's tradition and yes, there's, but don't feel like you're boxed thin. If, you, if you're at home and you've got shrimp and you've got, you know, uh, everything but cilantro, make, make the agua chili, it's gonna come out great. You don't necessarily have, need to have every single ingredient. Okay, the red onion is very, very important for this recipe. Um, so uh, I've, I've peeled it, taken the, the root end off and the other end off, and I'm gonna, it's called julienne. And I'm gonna julienne it really, really fine. I like to julienne it. You could also dice it if you wanted to, but you can see I'm cutting it really, like shaving it almost. It just looks a lot nicer, in my opinion, on the plate. All right. Okay, and then our cilantro. Now, um, Cilantro. So there's, I want to talk about how to cut cilantro because some people say, you know, just chop the cilantro. No. Even like say culinary students I have at the restaurant, they'll come in and they'll start chopping away. Well, herbs like cilantro and mint and basil and parsley and I call them soft herbs. They're very delicate. And most of the time your knife is not going to be that sharp. And what's going to happen is you're going to bruise the herb and you're going to end up like squeezing all the water out and it kind of turns black. Yep. So make sure you have a sharp knife. 17 degrees. I mean, that was like 17 and a half right there. And um, what we're going to do is called chiffonade, or in other words, it's, uh, we're going to cut them, cut them into threads. So I'm going to kind of group them in my finger like this, and I'm going to cut it really, really thin. And once I'm cutting it, I'm done. I don't want to go back over them again. This way, they'll stay nice and bright green. So you can see it's really kind of fine. You can see that right there. And that's just one time going through. So I've got all my mise en place on this plate here, you know, and it just makes it so much easier. You've got all your ingredients ready to go. And that's how we, I always cook, whether it's at the restaurant, uh, cooking for like 50 people or whether I'm at home cooking for my family, it just make things, makes things a lot easier uh, for your conscious and also just, just in terms of being organized and getting and executing the final dish. Okay, so avocado. Um, this avocado we got from a friend. I don't know exactly. I want to say it's like a, it might be a bake. It's not a Haas avocado. It's thin skin, um, but it is awesome. Yeah, it's a friend of ours has a tree, and we've been using these guys, and they are incredible. I mean, well, the kind of the, sort of the skin stayed on there, but you can see how green that is. And they are just, the, uh, the oil content is amazing on these things. And so... Sometimes the skin will come off. Like I, I cut it into quarters. So right, I cut it into quarters. This this pit here, usually you can kind of tap on it, it comes right out, right? Um, now 
most of the time you can take an avocado if it's ready and you can kind of just peel it off like that. Okay, super simple. This is like a perfect avocado. If not, what you can do is you can take a spoon and kind of just scoop it out. You know, so it's really up to you. Um, this avocado is really cooperating. All right. And um, I've got also this really, really great sauce I'm going to share with you guys right now that Lucy's mom actually showed me. I saw, I think I saw her making it in her kitchen one, one time. So usually like if I go to, you know, Lucy, my wife's house, uh, her parents' house, I'll usually be hanging out with her mom in the kitchen. I'm like, ah, screw everybody else. I'm going to be hanging out with her mom in the kitchen. You know, I just, I think it's, she's just a great chef and um, we have a lot of fun in there. And I saw her making this salsa one time that she usually serves with pozole. She makes a pozole verde and she was throwing lettuce and avocado and lime juice, I think, and salt into a blender and making like a lettuce salsa. And I was just so fascinated by it because it was so like fresh and kind of watery. And, and so she would kind of spread it on the tostadas and then you dip the tostadas in the pozole. So I use that now. I, I've done a little, uh, you can see that. It's a little thicker than maybe she makes it, but it's got avocado. In mine, I put avocado, lettuce, a little bit of garlic, lime juice, salt, and pepper, and I put it in a blender and blend it up, and it's a great to smear on the uh, tostada before you put the agua chili on there. Or on flautas. Or on flautas, But part of the yeah. reason why she discovered this recipe was because there were seven of us, so avocados were a luxury, and she had to make it rendir. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank, uh, thank goodness for me. And thank goodness for you. <laughs> All right, so I've got pretty much all of my ingredients here. All right, so shall we play it up? Yes, because then we'd love to have some time for the cocktail mixing to make it a complete yeah, afternoon. Yeah, yeah, okay. How are we looking on time, okay? We got time for the cocktail? We gotta have time for the cocktail. We absolutely do, we got 20 okay. minutes, so please do. I've got this beautiful platter here. I, I love using this for, for, uh, for seafood. And uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of this, uh, all the lime juice that uh, I use to marinate, I don't want to use that again. I don't want to serve this because it has um, kind of like the blood of, of the shrimp, I guess. But I'm going to put fresh uh, lime juice in it to finish it. So I'm going to put it in the, in the plate, kind of spread it out. Okay. All right, now. I'm gonna sort of garnish all these the radishes around and the cucumbers. You could dice the cucumbers if you want. You can cut them lengthwise, like into ribbons. Really have fun with it. You know, it's up, up to you. Some red onion. Make sure you kind of break up the red onion. You don't really want it to have too too big of chunks, otherwise you're gonna have some serious onion breath. Some cilantro. And like a day like today, a warm day like today, it's, this is a perfect dish. And of course the chiles. Okay, and then I'm gonna throw some avocados kind of here and there just to kind of decorate it. So I'd say this is like enough for like, well, this is enough for me actually, but uh, I'll probably have to share this with the family. But um, so, All right. Now for the sauce, it's a very, very simple. I'm gonna take a few more limes. And I'm gonna squeeze them fresh, of course. And then a little uh, special touch I like to put with my agua chili, it's a little different, is a little bit of soy sauce. Um, you know. Uh, Almost like a ponzu. Kind of like a ponzu, yeah. You know, there's like, I don't know if you know this, but you know, I, I read a great story in Saber Magazine about how the Mexican government hired Japanese fishermen to come to Mexico, like Baja California, I think during the 50s, I believe, to show them how to fish more efficiently. And in turn, they brought tempura and soy sauce and all these different ingredients. So that's why when you're in Baja California, you see a lot of like soy, you see a lot of like um, the fish taco, the tempura, that's basically what it is. Um, a lot of influence, which is really fascinating. So I love, I love that kind of fusion. It's really wonderful. So I'm gonna put a little bit of soy sauce in there. 
And of course the soy sauce is gonna give us some salt, but I'm still gonna put a little more salt because I don't want all my salt in the soy sauce, just a little bit of it. And I'm just gonna spoon it on top. Ooh, that looks really, really good. So refreshing. You really wanna to try to eat this really cold as well. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit extra salt. And of course, my favorite, some black pepper. And then if you wanna get kind of fancy, you could always put like, uh, you know, maybe throw some lime wedges on there and maybe throw some cilantro sprigs. Kind of just make it a little, you know, extra decorated. And that's it. Boom. Beautiful. Super yummy, super simple. Super healthy too. Super healthy, yeah. So we gotta try this out real quick. You wanna share one with me? Okay, so we're gonna take our tostada and we're gonna smear some of this delicious uh, lettuce avocado uh, salsa. Not too much, but just enough to kind of, you know, kind of hold the, the shrimp on there. How long was the shrimp marinating there in the lemon juice, Brett? This one was like about an hour and a half. Um, but again, you could do it, you know, you could do it up to overnight if you really wanted to. Just the longer you keep it in the lemon juice and the salt, the more it's going to be marinated and more it's going to be cooked. You, you, you can, you you're welcome. You can overdo it, especially with ceviche, because the fish will kind of get like mealy yeah. in your mouth. But um, the shrimp's a little more hearty. So what would be the perfect wow. cocktail to accompany that right, right. now? So I'm going to keep it really simple. Um, we're going to do like a four ingredient margarita. I am going to use a mezcal because I love mezcal. And it just feels like one of those kind of days. That's called day. Um, so, so I hate talking when I'm eating right here. <clears throat> so I've got fresh agave nectar. I don't really, I don't generally use sugar or any, I love agave nectar. It just has a certain viscosity. And you can really feel it in the product when you're done. Mezcal. Uh, this mezcal is from Los Javis, our friends from uh, Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. Uh, this varietal is called Espadin, and Espadin is, um, it's a cultivated uh, agave, one of the, probably the most popular uh, variety of agave. I think it's probably the easiest one to cultivate. Delicious. Yeah, it's um, one of my favorites. Don't you love it? I like also a good tequila, yeah. but we'll, we'll save this one for later. Okay. Um, I've got a little bit of sparkling water because I like, I like using sparkling water, a little bit of, of fizz. And, uh, and then of course some fresh, I'm gonna use the Meyer lemons because they're gonna be awesome with this. So, all right. And also one thing um, at the restaurant we make is called Pez powder. So it's our version, our answer to that, that other chili powder in the market that we're gonna, you know, we won't mention, but uh, chili, <laughs> chili and lime powder. I've got original, uh, which is chili and lime. And I've got green, which is jalapeno and lime. And we're gonna do a little bit of each. I've really been getting into the jalapeno one recently. It's just, it's the spiciest of the trio. Yeah, because the trio, the last of the trio is the black, which is Chipotle. So, so we're gonna have these guys here and I'm gonna show you guys how to rim a drink. So you can just do one if you want, but I've got two out here. Now, um, I'm gonna put a little bit of agave on the plate and that's gonna just help really rim the drinks thick. You could just take like a, so I've got these cool Mexican hand-blown glasses. You could just take a lime wedge and kind of just do like that. But the agave or even honey works also really, really well. But so I'm gonna do half with that and half with the jalapeno. You can see it really coats it nicely. Mm -hmm. And you wanna have a lot on there because it's just, you know, you got this good sized cocktail and then you don't want to run out of Pez powder halfway through. So you want to make sure you put on a good amount on there. You can enjoy it throughout the drink. All right. So again, you could use, uh, you know, if you really had to, you could just dip it in water. It, it would just, the agave makes it stick a lot better. 
Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is we have a shaker and I've got some crushed ice. I like using crushed ice as opposed to ice cubes just because, I don't know, it's just sort of like shakes better and it feels better in the mouth and I feel like it chills it out quicker. And I'll actually, some, some drinks we'll do is we'll shake it and we'll kind of strain it out, but I'm gonna put the whole shebang in there. I think it's better to have a little extra ice than not enough ice also. Mm -hmm. okay. And then we're gonna put about, uh, so I put about two ounces of, of mezcal per cocktail. Uh, it's maybe we'll put two and a half ounces today. And then a little more ice. Okay, and I'm gonna put about an ounce per on the agave. I don't want it to be too sweet. All right, and then we're gonna go freshly squeeze Meyer lemons. I probably will need three. And again, if you don't have Meyer lemons, use limes. If you don't have limes, use grapefruit. If you don't have grapefruit, you know, blood oranges. You can do a combination of any of those uh, regular lemons. But it again, the, I think the most important part of the cocktail is really the is really the balance of sweet and sour, and of course having enough mezcal. Yes. And when I'm doing this, all that beautiful oil, all the zest oil, is going into the cocktail as well. So the, I mean, that is just such a killer cocktail. And you know, sometimes we've got a lemon verbena plant in the front of the, of the house, and I'll put some lemon verbena and kind of muddle in there. Or, basil or whatever you know oh yeah <laughs> all right this is my favorite part <laughs> yeah, that's the way i do it at home. Champagne. <laughs> yeah there you go i don't have one of those fan i don't bring the fancy stuff from the Sports. restaurant all right and then you can see it's just so nice and frothy in there the shaking the agitation really really helps Oh, wow. Only two? <laughs> Only two. Come on over, Abelardo. I'm the number two. <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Perfect. OK. And then um, let's see. I'm going to throw a little. And this is great also to make a mocktail. Our kids um, play with this all the time, and they rim their own glasses, and they just add their own, like, um, house-made lemonade and because it's sparkling water we use the soda stream because it's just easy um but it's, i didn't put the water really in there great. but that's okay we're going to be a little extra punchy uh yeah and also the kids drink it without alcohol you said that right <laughs> i said a mocktail <laughs> so can you tell our folks here who are new to our en casa con la plaza where beautiful pez cantina is loca located cheers uh, your cheers. website information Tamana. cheers Abelardo. thank you Hello. So Thank we are guys. normally located at 40 Grand, 40 Grand, 401 mm. Grand Avenue. We're on Bunker Hill. We've got a beautiful outdoor patio, and uh, we can't wait to be open. Right now, we are just doing delivery and takeout, although we have been given the green light to do some uh, indoor dining. But until then, you can take any of our cocktails to go, any of the ceviches, travel super well um, mm -hmm. to eat at home. Um, we do uh, all the other all of our different proteins, like the carnitas, carne asada, chicken tinga by the pound. You can build your own taco building station at home. So yeah. um, it's fun. And all of our all of our uh, craft, uh, Pez craft cocktails come with your own plastic shakers. So if you don't have one at home, we include one for you. Yep. Um, you can add on any of the Pez uh, flavorings to rim your glass. And people have really been getting creative with how they make their cocktails at home. And it's been really great to see that you can follow us on instagram we post quite often we do a lot of insta stories and we do a lot of fun events yeah i mean you got cheers. tacos cheers you got tacos by the pound you got mariscos agua chile your cocktail your pez powder it's it's really a, a party to take home so mm. from our casa to your casa oh that's nice thank yes. you well thank you so much thank you so much uh thank you and uh, Lucille and uh, Jimena, thank you. This was great. Uh, thanks to all who tuned in today. We had uh, some great questions, some great comments. 
uh, from uh, Irma Escobar asking about the iodized salt. We had uh, Elizabeth Greer asking some questions about uh, where to get the seafood. Uh, Ale Baosa loved the, the lettuce cup idea. And uh, I can't wait to, to try out this recipe myself. Come on over. All right, we will. Okay, I'm gonna just uh, give a shout out to, of course, Pes Cantina for helping us out at La Plaza, in Casa con La Plaza Cocina every Monday at three o'clock. Uh, let me talk a little bit about what's up for this week. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen real quickly and uh, talk about what's going, coming up for this week. And uh, every, every week we have at least three programs, but coming up, we have Corridos Cumbias y Coronavirus with Professor, Associate Professor Marisa Lopez, who'll talk about all the, the different artistic expression of what's going on during these times. Uh, artists and, and musicians doing corridos and cumbias, talking about the situation. Should be entertaining and enlightening. Uh, on Thursday, uh, we have the noted author Julissa Arce and a student out of the Verne, Kimberly Hernandez, who will give us a, a conversation about being undocumented in higher education. Right now, of course, uh, so many students had to leave their campuses uh, because of the, the crisis, but there's, there's students that have challenges and including these two, Julissa, Julissa who had made it out of uh, college and university while undocumented, Kimberly Hernandez, who's presently a student. Then finally, on Friday, the great Beto Arcos, a radio journalist with NPR, with uh, KPFK, uh, giving a, a presentation about the African influence in Latin American music, coinciding with uh, our exhibition at La Plaza, uh, Afro-Latinidad, Mi Casa, My City, and this will be a, a, a first of its kind session for our session for En Casa Con La Plaza with live musicians Cesar Castro, Angelo Salazar, and Eduardo Martinez playing from their home studios and joining together to give a sample of the African influence of Latin American music. So that's this week. We have a lot of other stuff coming on. Here I'm going to just uh, share our website. It's LAPCA. You could find our programs for the weeks to come here. You could also click on here and catch all of our recorded sessions. Uh, and you'll be able to catch this one uh, in the next few hours on YouTube. We're on YouTube, we're on Facebook. We, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing because this isn't cooperating. There you go, that was last week's. Um, we're on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and uh, YouTube at La Plaza LA. Thank you very much for joining us. Please stay safe, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and we'll see you here on Wednesday. So, adios. Thank Hasta you, guys. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. And did I thank our sponsors? No, nope. AARP and Walmart. Thank you very much, AARP California and Walmart, for helping to sponsor En Casa con la Plaza. Whew. Good catch. <laughs>